Hey, online, you guys ready for God's word? I hope you are, because I am. So here's what I'm going to ask the online community to do while we get ready here and go into God's word. Just type it in the chat there. I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. Now, for those of you that have been with Journey a long time, one of the things that I like are exclamation points. So go ahead and throw in a couple of exclamation points after I'm ready. Maybe two, three, five. It really warms my heart, all right? <laughs> all right. I'm going to open us up with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump in. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that you are here. We thank you that you inhabit the praises of your kids. We want to hear from you now. Speak, Lord. Speak. We want to hear your voice. We want to put off all distractions, all the things that we may have come with, all the burdens and problems and pain and pressure that we may experience or been experiencing this week. We want to put those off to the side, and we want your word to just come over us, encourage us, minister to our hearts this morning. Father, we pray that you would have your way amongst us. We pray in advance for the good things you are going to do in the lives of your people through the worship of the preaching of your word. We love you, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Today we're kicking off a brand new series out of the book of Galatians entitled Living Free. Living Free. And I've entitled it that way because we will see through this beautiful book how it speaks to the freedom that we have when we truly understand the gospel of Jesus and really understand and comprehend what Jesus has done on our behalf. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through kind of a verse-by-verse -verse look at the truths uh, found in this wonderful book. And I'm excited to do that, especially since there are so many new people to our church. A lot of new followers of Jesus are really going to enjoy and want to hear this message, as well as a lot of Christians that have been walking with Jesus for a long time. See, it's really common uh, within Christian circles to assume that the gospel is something mainly, you know, for, for, for the new people. It's, it, it's something mainly for those non-Christian folks. And, and we see it kind of sort of a basic A, B, C doctrines that are, are really the way to get into the kingdom. And, and so many believe that, yet that what Paul is, is trying to break through and explain to us in this basic message is that uh, this letter is not only just the gospel, the A through Z of the Christian faith, but this is the gospel, this is the way that you enter into the kingdom, and this is the gospel that helps you live in the kingdom. And the book of the Galatians, as well as most of the New Testament, is there to help you, ground you, to help to, there to get you solid, uh, to get you doctrine, and to give you a foundational teaching on some of God's truths. Now, most of the New Testament, 13 books or so, uh, was written by the, a, a man by the name of Apostle Paul. And the apostle, what that word simply means is that Paul wasn't a pastor. Paul was actually a church planter. In fact, what he did, he would go into these different areas uh, outside of Israel, and he would bring the gospel. And he felt that this was his call. God brought him to these regions to bring the gospel or the good news to non-Jewish people. Those are often referred to as Gentiles. And so he did that. Paul went across uh, what is now today mostly modern-day Turkey, so kind of northwest of where Israel is currently located, and they have some beautiful coast ranges uh, there, and he planted church. And so after he planted these churches, he would raise up these leaders, get leadership kind of in order, and then go and do it again in other areas. But in order to maintain them, he would write them these reports. He would write them these uh, letters, these, these words of encouragements to let them know how they are doing, what they should be expecting. And, and the Bible calls these letters actually epistles, but they're just basically little letters that helped establish the church and help them grow. In fact, in a lot of your, uh, the books in the New Testament were written to churches. So, so you have names, uh, the books of your Bible are organized in the New Testament by names of cities. So you have the uh, book of Corinthians that was written to the city at Corinth. Then you have the book of Philippians that was written to the city at Philippi. Then you have the book of Colossians that was written to the city of Colossae. And some of the books themselves were not really written for the regions, but they were written for the pastors of those churches. That's uh, you have a name attached to that book. So for instance, like the book of Timothy, he was a pastor. All that to say is that when you read these little books, it gives those people and us today what we need, and that is sound doctrine and teaching. 
And how do we live this Christian life? How do we live this Christian life? And so the book of Galatians is an incredible book because in this area of Galatia, right, kind of in the heart of this great city, Paul planted this church. And after he left, some Christians that were Jews, so, so Jewish Christians, uh, who didn't really have their faith and, and doctrine kind of grounded, came behind Paul and they told these new Christians, hey, you're not quite doing it right. You're not quite doing it right. Right? And what happened was there were a lot of social, racial, and cultural division in the church, which leaked into their understanding of the gospel. And so this letter to the Galatians is, is really a corrective letter to communicate this one big idea. How do you live free? How to stay free? Really, how to keep the right perspective of the gospel? How to keep from falling back into these religious sort of rituals? So we're just going to jump right in, and we're going to look at these great truths uh, this morning. If you have your word, you can open it up to Galatians. If you don't, just follow along on the screen. Here's what it says. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. In fact, most of the things that the apostle Paul wrote to us, he, he received by direct revelation from Jesus himself. So what Paul is declaring right here off the bat, he's saying, hey, I'm not speaking from, from my own kind of made up ideology. This is, I receive this from God. So I'm speaking to you from a place of authority. And he says, this is who was raised, who raised him from the dead and all the brothers and sisters with me. So he's traveling kind of with a posse. He's got his entourage with him. He says to the churches in Galatia. So that's the heart of modern day Turkey, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, watch this word, I love this, to rescue us from the present evil age, to rescue us from the present evil age. I love that because Paul is describing here our condition right? We were hopeless and we were lost. We needed rescuing. We needed a savior. Other founders of religious uh, uh, institutions came to teach principles. They came to teach philosophy, but they never came to rescue us. Jesus taught. Jesus healed. Jesus was all about social justice during his time here on earth, but those were secondary, if not tertiary, results of his primary ministry. Jesus Jesus came to rescue us, to set us free from the bondage of sin. That was his primary focus. He came to die a substitutionary death for you and I to bring us back into right relationship with God. And he did it all according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, in the next verse, this is where we're going to camp out this morning. This is where we're going to be. In fact, I would argue that the next verse may be the key verse of this entire book. And that's going to be verse 6. And this is what Paul says. He says, I am astonished. In other words, I'm just so surprised. He's actually kind of like really angry here. He's a little fed up. He, he's actually got a little bit of attitude here. He's saying, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace. Grace is a key word here. He says, hey, I'm so surprised, you guys, that, that the teaching that I gave you, this freedom that you found through grace, that you're turning right back, and I want you to catch this phrase, you're turning to a different gospel to a different gospel to which some of you are like, I don't even know there were more than one. There absolutely are. There absolutely is. And he finishes out and he says, actually, that's no gospel at all. So we'll come back to this in a second, but let's finish out the rest of this first section. It says, evidently, he goes on to say, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, so, so the right perspective, let them be under God's curse. I mean, can you, can you sense the, the anger and kind of the frustration? And he's, 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 he's laying it out. And then he says it again. By the way, if you haven't heard me the first time, I say it again now. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you've accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I trying to win the approval of human beings? Or am I trying to win the approval of God? 
Am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So, so Paul is passionate right here in the beginning. He, he, he's very emotional in this letter. He's frustrated. He's upset. He's astonished. It's almost as if his, his heart is bleeding because he loves these people so much. It's not, hey, how's Martha? How's Rita? How are them kids? Right? That's not what he's saying. No, he's, he's aching for them because he's realizing that these Christians are being ripped off spiritually by false teachers who are trying to put them back under the law. And I want to, what I want you to understand this morning is this is Paul's heart. It's not only his heart, but it's a reflection of God's heart for us, who was inspiring Paul to write this letter. God's heart for us is that we are in the right gospel and not in the wrong one. And there are literally two different approaches to God or two different gospels. And, and one of them is no gospel at all. So he's really fed up because what would happen is these Jewish Christians, now watch this, came behind, and literally what they did, and this is kind of shocking to some, this may be embarrassing for some of you to hear this, but these Jewish Christians, because they were raised Jewish, part of the Old Testament law of being godly meant that they had to be circumcised, right? So that was part of the Jewish custom. Well, most of these men were circumcised on the eighth day. So they don't remember the circumcision, which obviously makes it a little easier. So they come along to these Christians now, and they say, Hey, in order to be in our Christian club, we know that you're not Jewish, but you still need to get circumcised. To which that would have been a pretty shocking meeting. So you can imagine, as you can imagine, but, but this was a big deal to them. In fact, in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 15, it's actually, they have a debate over this topic. It's a pretty shocking meeting. The church leaders were literally debating whether or not they should include in their membership class a surgery for those who haven't been circumcised. That would have made that membership class female only. Come on, man. Where are you all at, right? Like, like honey, you go sign us up. I'm away here in the car. You go sign up. <laughs> Think about that, right? So, so they're having this debate, right? What they're doing is, is, watch this, what all of us tend to do from time to time, once we find this grace, this freedom, this free gift, the love of God, right? There is a tendency to go back, right back, into kind of a religious type of relationship with God, a religious type of gospel instead of a grace-centered gospel. That's why he says, hey, don't please men, don't worry about what men say, please God. And if somebody else is coming teaching other, something other than what we have taught you, let them be cursed. And most of us today have received Jesus and found freedom, found his great grace, yes, yet it's just so human nature to go right back into not what Jesus has done for us, but what we can do for ourselves and turn even the freest expression of God's grace and goodness in the gospel to something that turns into dead religion. This was kind of kind of my story growing up. Like, I grew up, uh, my dad was, for those of you that don't know, he was a pastor. So I had this pastor's kid, what we refer to as PKs, had this pastor's kid, PK, uh, a stigma associated with me. And, and a question that everybody would always ask me is, hey, when are you going to get baptized? I mean, your dad's preaching, saving all these people, and, uh, and you're still not walking with Jesus. What's going on? And, and you know what my go-to response was? I'm not ready. See, somewhere in my faith journey, I picked up this idea that being a Christian is all about having it together, obeying all the rules, all the lists of do's and, do and don'ts, and, and can't do this, and can't do that, and, and can't go there. And you know, we, we don't chew or smoke, and we don't go with girls that do, right? <laughs> Anybody ever heard that? Okay, maybe that's just my, that's, that's just me, right? But we would, we would have to pray and go to church and, and do all these things. And I, and I can't do that. I, I can't keep all these rules, especially while I'm in high school. I mean, how am I going to do that? I, I just can't make it. I can't keep up. What kind of Christian would I be? God would look at me and say, hey, that's not my son. You're embarrassing me. Come on, get it together. And without realizing it, I was basically trying to earn my way to God. So I would try really hard. And what would happen is I would fail. And I would try some more, and I would fail, and then I had guilt, and then I had shame. And then I would try harder and try harder, and it became increasingly more tiresome and frustrating. Moreover, I started getting really 
upset with Christian people, you people, right? Because they became very judgy. They would say, ha, 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 look at him. And it was all based around my performance. Now, what I didn't realize is if I can't keep the rules in high school, when I got to college, right? New level, bigger devil. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. <laughs> He had it all changed when one summer I really experienced this message, that what it means to truly be free, the, the real gospel. And I went to a, a camp out in Long Beach, Washington, and I heard the minister speak about the difference between religion and relationship. And he explained that religion is simply man's attempt to get to God, where relationship with God is simply, hey, I'm just into this because I've fallen in love with a person by the name of Jesus, and he has paid for my sins, and now all I have to do is just receive his love, receive his grace. It's a free gift. And I've, somewhere I've never heard that before. Of course, it's all in the Bible, <laughs> right? But I heard that message, and it really set me free, free from the bondage of always trying to gain Cry, gain God's approval, and it just changed my life. And so I want that for you. I hope that message gets drilled in this morning because Paul had a real problem with these people who would come behind him, and they are re distorting or kind of rebranding Christianity. And this happens today, right? This problem is not only for the church and all that we're trying to accomplish, but we really have a branding problem. And the branding problem is not just for us, but it's for you. It's because we often can easily go back right into the other gospel, even when we've received Jesus in the right gospel. That's why I'm teaching you this beautiful book of how to live in freedom every day. So here's the key question we're going to try to answer today, all right? The key question for today, if you're taking notes, write this down. How am I going to become godly? How do I become godly? So in other words, what's my approach to getting to God going to look like? How do I approach him? How do I serve him? How am I gonna do it in my life? My approach to godliness. By the way, this is a question for all religions. They all pose this question. All religions have a pathway to their deity, to their godliness. So, so man's in some kind of condition. It's not right. So that religious religion has a teaching, and then it has a pathway to getting to whatever their god is. Well, Christianity is really no different. The trouble is most people choose the pathway like all the other religions. And that's no pathway at all. It's not the right pathway. Even in Christianity, it can be messed up and it gets perverted. And honestly, we can become like that Galatian church. Now, this idea is so foundational. This is such a core message of my life, and it needs to be a core message of our church. And I think it needs to be taught as often as possible. It is so foundational that it ends up being the very first story after God created the heavens and the earth, so the creation story, when he starts talking to man, it's in the very first story. And I think that's on purpose, by the way, that it's the very first thing. By the way, the stories I'm about to share with you are in the last chapter of your Bible as well. So literally from cover to cover, this is the theme that I want you guys to understand. So I'm going to explain it to you in the first story, and then we're going to get real practical and have some fun. You guys still with me? All right, here we go. Genesis chapter 2. Now watch this. Now the Lord had planted a garden in the east in Eden. That's the garden of Eden. And there he put a man that he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Now watch this. Right in the middle of the garden, God puts a choice. All right, now let me clear something up right here for us. Most people think that in the Garden of Eden story, if, you know, if you grew up in Sunday school, you kind of learned the story and, and you saw Adam and Eve, and of course Eve had long hair because she had to cover stuff up, right? That's, that's the good Chris child story, uh, children's book. Uh, anyway, she has long hair and she has this apple with a bite in it, right? And most people say, yeah, that's when Adam and Eve just chose to walk away from God and be in sin. But that's not it at all. They actually had a different choice in front of them, and it was actually way deadlier. And that choice leads to sin, but it wasn't originally sin. Because in the middle of the garden were these two trees. One was, watch this, I underlined them, the tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
right? So it was a knowledge base. It was a worldview. It was what's my approach going to be to get to God? How am I going to become godly? You basically have a choice. You can do it through the tree of life, or you can do it, you can become godly by a knowledge base, through the knowledge of good and evil, through this other tree. Now watch what God says in the next verse. He says, and the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of this, this knowledge base thing, this, this worldview. Don't let that be your worldview. For when you eat from that tree, you will certainly die. It will kill you. In fact, it rejects Christianity altogether. It will put you in this religious tailspin that can destroy every aspect of your life. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy your emotions. It will destroy everything. It's that critical. Well, obviously, God wants us to be in the right relationship with him, right? And the devil, he doesn't. So insert the devil in chapter 3. The devil comes in the form of a serpent. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say that? Come on, come on, think about it. Re- you, you sure you heard him correctly? It's exactly what these Jewish Christians were coming to the church of Galatia and saying, uh-uh, are you sure this is the way? Are you sure that apostle was really the man of God and he was the right way? And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now watch what the devil says next. He says, that's not true. That's not the right way. You heard it wrong. No, you will certainly not die, he says. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And watch this, you will be like God. You will be like God. Now, I want to point out to you here that, listen, the devil did not appeal to Eve's desire to be rebellious or to be sinful. He appeals to Eve's desire to be godly. He said, come my way. I'll show you how to be very godly. I want you to see that because most people think that the devil came and he was just like tempting them to do all these bad things and just go live a life and do whatever you want. No, 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 no. The devil says, if you do it my way, it's the better way. You'll actually be like God. The exact thing you're trying to do is become godly. And there's the word again. You will know the knowledge base, good from evil. So you will have this worldview. He says, this idea which, where, where you literally can control your godliness and it's better. So she buys into it and, and so does Adam. And when the woman saw the fruit of the tree that was good uh, for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirous, desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She gave it to, to her husband who was with her and he ate it as well. And watch what happens when they made the wrong religious choice. And this happens every time you make the wrong religious choice. Verse 7 tells us, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. In fact, God comes later on to them, and they hide from God. They run from God. And he says to them, Hey, where are you? Who told you that you were in this condition? Why are you running? So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings from themselves. So wrote us right off the bat two things, the loss of innocence, and shame, because every time we make the wrong religious choice or we go into the wrong gospel, it always produces loss of innocence, and there is shame. There is shame. Now, this foundational story is so critical for you to know, and I know that this can be a little deep and a little tough for some people to grasp. So what I'm going to do is we're just going to get real practical, and I'm going to explain it in three ways to make sure you understand the difference between the choice that is in front of you right now. So if you're taking notes, write these down. This is the other gospel. The other gospel focuses on what you do. In fact, it's all about what you do. And it's all about uh, always thinking about what you do. So let me give you an example, right? So you're not thinking about reading your Bible because you love your Bible. You're thinking about how many chapters you've read. So I used to read five chapters a day, but now I'm at eight chapters a day. And if you're still at one chapter a day, well, you just don't have what I have. Like, you're just not as holy as I am, and you just don't get it. You don't have it, right? You ever been in places where that happens? 
You've ever been in churches where, where that happens? By the way, that can happen right here too, where you think, well, I've been at Journey for five years now, and all you young people, all you new people that are here, you don't know Pastor Adrian like I know Pastor Adrian, and you, you just don't have it. You just don't have the in. Listen, everybody, we, none of us have it. We, we are nothing. It's not about Journey Church. It's not based on what we did or what we will ever do. No, that's not the gospel. The real gospel, the gospel of Jesus, focuses on what Jesus has done, what he's already done for you. So, so here's how this plays out. So now you're not thinking about how much do I pray, how much do I read, how, much, how many chapters, how much I've served. No, you've ever been around places where people kind of size you up spiritually? right? And they're always doing it because uh, they're always looking down on you based on the things that they're already doing well. Well, well, I pray every morning, and I'm a morning devotional person prayer. And if you're not one of them prayer, then, then you, you don't have what I have. And by the way, you're going to hell, right? And if you're from the South, it's a two-word syllable, hell, y'all, right? <laughs> Turn or burn, right? That's not it at all. Because they're always focusing on what you do. Well, that's not the focus at all. The focus should be on what Jesus has done. He did it all. It is all through him and for him. And to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. So let me say it this way. So when I'm reading my Bible, I'm not thinking about how much of it I'm reading. I'm thinking about how much of Jesus I can find in what I'm reading. Right? So, so like, where are you, Lord? I, I just want to find you. If that's in two verses, if that's in 10 verses, if that's in 10 chapters, whatever it takes, I just want to find you. I want to find you alone. I need to get closer to you. I'm not sizing how much I've done. I'm not sizing myself based on what I've done. And you ready for this? This just drives me crazy. When, when you hear this in the pastoral world, like how much theology they know. And some people think they got the corner on the theological market because they have this deeper understanding than you do. Now, that's not the purpose at all. Let me to show it to you in scripture. Watch this. John 5 says, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that in them, so in your smartness and all the things that you're c- c- coming up with and all these backgrounds and all this stuff that you have in them, you will have eternal life. Listen, you're you're not, you're you're missing it, Jesus tells them. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. So you're like learning, you're memorizing, you're doing all these things to get this gold star. Now listen, don't misunderstand me. It's good to know the Bible. It's good to memorize the Bible. I want you trained in the Bible, but not so that you can just have this knowledge thing. I want you to know so you can know Jesus because they testify about him. Yet you refuse to come to him and have life. That word life is all throughout the Bible. I'll show you some more verses as we go. Gotta make a choice. Life. All right, here's the second thing. The other gospel focuses on getting God's approval. Getting God's approval, right? Because inherently, people, we believe that God is mad at us. God is mad at us. God is waiting up there with a lightning bolt in his hand, waiting for us to fail. And then when we do and when we miss it, burnt barbecue, right? I remember as as a kid, have you guys ever uh, seen those chick tracks? Anybody ever seen those like little tracks that people would pass out? Well, when I was a kid, anyways, back this was in Southern California, these these two, um, God bless them, these two Baptist ministers come to my house with this chick track, and they were the nicest people, but this chick track was just, my goodness. Anyway, Jack Chick was this cartoonist, and he made these witnessing tools, and they're great. People use them all the time. Uh, people don't do that kind of stuff anymore, but, but my only criticism, and you've probably seen this, is that God was pictured in this like Abraham Lincoln type chair, and he had no face, and it was just all gold, and there was these rays emanating from his face, and, and man, as a kid, that was scary. It's like, wow, well, what kind of God is that? You Baptist people are scary. <laughs> right? But I'm convinced if you could see God right now, he's not mean. That's not him at all. God is up in heaven. He's saying, hey, I just love you so much. If you could only see how much I care about you. He's not up there in his chair being like, how'd you live this week? Right? Did you get it right? Because if, do- if you didn't, right? No. No, he's up there. Hey, I love you. I want to be with you. I-, I think about you. I delight in you. 
the best way I could portray this is actually, uh, have you guys ever seen The Wizard of Oz, the movie? I love that movie. It's, I actually just saw it the other day. By the way, that's kind of a creepy movie, right? <laughs> My goodness. I mean, I, I'm still, I still need to get deliverance from those lollipop kids, the lollipop kids, right? And, and those flying monkeys, my goodness, they need a life retreat. But <laughs> seriously, but there's this moment, watch this, where Dorothy, right, goes to the wizard, and he has the ability to grant her everything that she wants. And, and she goes to him, and she, he doesn't even know her, and yet he's mad at her, Right? He's mad at her. He doesn't even know her. What do you want? I just want to go home. Like, all right, well, then go prove your worth. Go get the broom, right? And we think that as Christians, somewhere along the line, we've adopted that that's the view of God. What do you want? I just want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. Well, go learn the book of Proverbs. What? No, we're trying to get God's approval. Can I tell you something? That's the wrong gospel. That's the other gospel. Here's the right perspective. The gospel focuses on receiving God's love, receiving God's love. Our focus is on receiving a love that already exists. Let me say it this way. God knows your sin life, and he still likes you. Now, he doesn't like what you did, right? Don't confuse the fact that he doesn't like the sin, but he loves you. He's in love with you. And when you understand that, you ready for this? It changes everything about the way that you relate to him. So let me say it this way. Your view of God will determine your relationship with God. How you see him will determine how you act with him. So, so this is how it plays out, right? So you're in church. You did a few things probably this week that you probably shouldn't have done, right? And so you're just here, and, 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 and everything in your mind is saying, hey, man, this is good worship. I should clap. I should kind of get into it. But, but, but Lord knows, you hear this voice, if I would do, I wouldn't do that if I were you because you'd be a hypocrite, right? But everything in your heart is drawing you, connecting you to God in your worship. But what, what do we do? We talk ourselves out of it. Because you think he is mad at you. This is good preaching, Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> preaching about 68% better than y'all responding. Just saying. Watch this, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his own love. How? How? He already did it. With this, while we were still sinners, we were far from him. Christ died for us. He didn't wait for you to change to start loving you. He loved you so you can change. You don't get your act together in order to get to God. No, you get to God so you can get your act together. He wants you to come in close, as close as you can, and love him as much as you can. And there you don't get condemnation. You get conviction from the Holy Spirit. And so, and so whatever you've done this week, run to him in worship. And that love will change everything. I love this verse. We love because he first loved us. In other words, the reason I worship, it's not because of what I did or what I didn't do this week. I worship because he first loved me. Even when I was being an idiot last week, he still loved. One of my biggest kind of pet peeves in my profession is when guys in my profession, pastors and such, they say things like, well, you know, 28 years ago, I surrendered to the ministry. I just, I just gave my life. And you, you ever heard a preacher say that? Yeah, like, I, I, you know, I gave my life. I answered the call of God, and, and it's been hell ever since, and I hate it, and I could have been working and making all this money, but I, I just gave my life to Jesus. Right? Like, man, you're eating out of the wrong tree, brother. Like, that's not the tree. Like, I, I love, I serve, I preach, because I, I, I can't believe that I get to do this. I love because he first loved us. This is just how it is. This is the joy of my life. And, and let me tell you, I want that for you so desperately. Right? Here's the third thing. The other gospel focuses on external duty. So do, do, do. You didn't pray enough. You didn't give enough. You didn't serve enough. Well, how much is enough? I don't know, but that's not enough. Anyway, we're always in this, like, trying to me measure this movable bar. And, okay, okay, well, I'll try my best. I don't want to do this, but I'm going to do this. The real gospel focuses on it's an internal desire. Like, I don't have to do this. I get to do this. It's just the joy of my life to be up here serving. Some of you may not know this. Most of you may not. But Sunday mornings, I get here really early in the morning. 
And what I do is I'll just encamp this whole block and just pray multiple times as I walk around this block. And I'm praying for you. I'm praying for this service, praying for people that come here that God would move and, and that God would show up. But one of the things I do is I just thank God every morning. God, I thank you. It's a privilege to be on this stage. It's a privilege to worship you. Thank you, God, for choosing me. It's just a delight that I get to do this. And I want that relationship for you. I don't want you approaching God because you have to. We don't do this because we have to. We do this because we want to. We do this because we get to. It, got from, it went from got to to now we get to. It's just a joy to read, to give, to serve, to pray. It's just a delight. Let me show you this awesome verse. It says, this is the love for God. So this is how you have God. Watch this. You obey his commandments. There it is, pastor. I told you. All that, you obey, obey. Watch that next line. And all his commandments are what? Not burdensome. I'll tell you something. Yes, they are. If you're not in love. If you're not in love with God, that Bible will be the hardest thing that you ever have to do in your life. But if you're in love, it's the greatest joy in your life to do what's written. Everything changes because of love. And then verse 12 says, he who has the son, say it with me, has what? Life. life. There it is again, life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. All right, so how, how? I'm going to go through this real quick. How do we do it? How do we stay in the right tree? In fact, I'm going to use that language throughout this entire series, okay? Now, I try really hard when I'm up here not to use any insider language. You may kind of gauge that about me already, but, but every church, in essence, ends up with some kind of insider language. So, so let's make this our code language throughout this series, eating from the tree of life. When you hear that, you're going to know what I'm talking about, that every day we're just going to be in that tree. We're not going to do this knowledge of good and evil thing, and no, we're going to stay in that tree of life. So, so here's kind of the, the cream of the message. How do you do it? Here's the first thing. Fall in love with Jesus. Fall in love with Jesus. And, turn, and in turn, love others like Jesus loved you. I had somebody come to me the other day, and I was talking to them in my office, and, and I told them this, and they were just like, but Pastor, you make it sound so simple. How? How, how do I do that? It's, it's just too easy. There's just two things. Two things when I think about my relationship and how I fell in love with Jesus. Number one, who he is. And number two, what he's done. So when I think correctly of who he is, I don't see this, you know, Abraham Lincoln in this lowrider chair with this faceless God with a club in his hand, right? No, I see God in heaven who laughs and who takes delight and takes pleasure in me and he wants me to uh, receive his love and know him. I, I mean, everybody doesn't get that. They, they see this mean God and far from God. No, he loves me. That's the correct view. Even while I'm still sinning far away from him. He loves me. And then the second thing is I think about what he's done for me. Last I checked, no one was in line to pay for my sins. I actually just checked last week. There was nobody there. <laughs> yeah, right? No one was willing to pay a gruesome death to pay a bill that I incurred. And, and when you realize those two things, I just can't give my life enough to God, my King, my Savior, my Daddy. So I want to encourage you to fall in love with God. We don't need you running around here being all religious. We need you running around being in love. Because once you are in love, the whole thing changes. This whole thing called Christianity becomes a delight. And then it changes everything about you. Here's a beautiful verse. Let me show you this out of John 14. If you love me, comma, you will obey my commands. Now for years, listen, as a Christian... I read this out of the wrong tree. Here's how I read this. Adrian, if you love me, you're going to prove that you love me by doing everything that I want you to do. You better be a good little boy, right? Don't even tell me that you love me if you don't do what I say. That's not what it says, okay? It says, if you love me, watch this, you will 
You just will. You don't even have to think about the commands. You focus on the love and receiving his love, and that will naturally result in obeying because you'll want to. So here's how this plays out. When I wake up in the morning, right, I don't have to uh, uh, tell myself and start walking myself through this. Okay, now, Adrian, you got to be faithful to Adela, right? And remember, there's a commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. So I slap my hand and slap my eyes every day and, and like, come on, come on, you can do this, right? you got to get this together right? No, no, I'm in love. I'm in love. I don't even have to think about it. I don't even have to look at anybody else because I'm so in love. Now, if I wasn't in love, I'd probably be looking. And that's what happens. So, so here's the question. Which side of the comma are you on? Are you on the love side or are you on the obeying side? Because this thing is in order. Love me first, and you'll obey. Just obey and think that's going to lead to that love relationship. It won't. You'll end up in my story, where you're just trying to prove and get God's approval. It won't. Next thing is this. Be careful. Two more minutes, and we're done. Be careful with this next word, condemnation. Don't allow condemnation in your life. Because you know what's going to happen? As soon as I finish this message, the devil is going to do what he did to Eve. And what's going to happen is exactly what happened to those Christians in Galatia. Somebody's going to come behind. It's going to be the devil. And they're going to say, uh-uh. Don't listen to that. You, you need to follow. You need to do all these things. And he works overtime to condemn you. He will never stop. In fact, don't expect him to stop. He will come along and say, that's not enough. You're not doing enough. And the tendency will be to go right back into this performance-based relationship thing and this religious thing rather than a real intimate relationship with God. That's why the Bible and Jesus always says, abide in me, remain in me, rest in me. Jesus gives us the be attitudes. They're not the do attitudes. We got to rest in him. By the way, this is not only towards you, but it's also towards others. One of the ways, the best ways that you know that you're eating from the wrong tree is how you view other people's sins, right? As soon as you start measuring people up, mm-hmm, oh, we know, we, we see you, mm-hmm, you know, girl, that's not her husband's car in the driveway, mm-hmm. When you start measuring up other people's sins, you're already out of the wrong tree. Because when you're in the tree of life, that, that's not where you go. You'll never be measuring up other people's sin. Be careful for condemnation. Write this verse down. We don't have time to unpack it. Romans 8, 1 and 2. You could read that on your own. Here's the last thing. You got to make this choice every day. I'm going to call the worship team forward. We're going to close. Make the choice every day. So here's our, our final verse. And this is really the invitation, right? This is out of Deuteronomy 30. This is what it says. This day, Moses was telling the people of Israel, I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you, watch this, life and death, blessing and curses, curses, curses. Where's the worship team curses? They're coming? All right. Anybody preaches another gospel, let them be. Never mind. <laughs> Come on, worship. There you go. Hey. There's a choice before you today. I love how this closes. Choose life. Choose life. Don't do that other gospel where it's shame and guilt and you're trying to earn God's approval and how much do I do? I don't know. It's not good enough. And, and we play this, well, well we're, you know, I'm, I, it's all about duty and it's all about performing and it's all about this external thing. No, God is saying, hey, I want you in the tree of life. I love you. I want relationship with you. It's already been done. Jesus has paid it all. Just receive that free gift of grace today.